So I recently acquired a couple of packs of a unique Kvaik dried yeast. It's made by a company in Norway. So my goal was to brew a 10 gallon batch of a smash beer, kind of a blonde ale, something that was kind of light bodied, refreshing, that would showcase this yeast and also give me 10 gallons of beer to take along to the Mid-Atlantic States homebrew camp out, mash out. Well, welcome to Cascades Homebrew. My name is Brent. So one aspect of homebrewing that I really enjoy is trying out new ingredients. So my girlfriend was recently visiting her sister in Norway. She looked around for some unique homebrewing ingredients. Well, we found some dried kvike yeast. The yeast came from the shop, brew shop, that's in Trondheim. So her sister lives in Bergen, but she was up in Trondheim for her niece's graduation. So she stopped in and ordered some packs. The stored website lists four different kvike yeast. Well, apparently they were out of the Voss one. So she got packs of each of the other three. So the company making these dried yeasts is called Kvike Yeastery. At least that's their English name. You can find more information at kvike.com. So their claim is real Norwegian yeast with unique fermentation properties, tastes, and aroma. So I haven't seen these yeasts available anywhere in the US. I'm not quite sure how available they are in other places in Europe. So I doubt I'm gonna pronounce the names of these Kvike yeast quite right. So the first one is called e -trame. The second one is maybe Stalgen. So if you go to that website, kvike.com, for each of their yeast, they list, say, a little bit of a history about each yeast, you know, like where it came from. They give some flavor descriptors of the yeast, some fermentation characteristics. They list some styles that it's applicable for. And then also you can drill down and get a technical data sheet for each of the yeast with a little bit more information. So I look at the information for that e-tram yeast. It mentioned fruity notes, ripe pear, plum, prune, and honey. Intensity is medium at high fermentation temperatures, and then at lower temperatures, it's gonna be less intense. Styles, they list IPA, pale ale, New England IPA, stouts and porters, and the fermentation temperature that they say, 18 to 42 degrees Celsius, or 64 to 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So that seems like pretty typical what I see for other Kvike strains. They can kind of ferment at those ale temperatures, but they also can get really hot. So looking at the descriptors for the Stalgen, says notes of apples and ripe fruit and hint of cloves and anise, medium to high intensity at high fermentation temperatures and less intense at lower temperatures. And for this one, they say, we'll get nice crisp beer similar to a lager at those lower temperatures. They mentioned for styles, say farmhouse ales, stouts, porters, seasonal beers, IPAs, and many more. The fermentation temperature for Stalgen is in a lower range. They listen eight degrees Celsius to 38 degrees Celsius or 46 degrees to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, so that reaches up at that high temperatures, but it's also down in those lager temperatures. So my batch is fermented kind of at a room temperature, like that 75 degrees Fahrenheit range. All right, so let's take a quick look at the recipe, and the brew day, and come back here so I can taste those beers. So as I mentioned, this is a Kvike beer, a smash beer, single malt, single hop. I'm kind of calling this about a blonde ale, Batch size was 11 gallons or 41.6 liters. Bitterness was calculated at kind of a low 19 IBUs. Color 3.3, so very light color. Formulated the recipe around an 80% efficiency. I thought maybe the sparge I'd get a little bit more. Didn't come at that, but that would have gave me an original gravity, 1048, final gravity of 1011 with an ABB of 4.9. So I start off by measuring out the total water they're gonna need for the mash and the sparge. That's 3.8 gallons or 52 liters of my tap water. To add, I add a tablet of Campton. That's to make sure I remove the chlorine and chloramines from my tap water. And then I separate out the sparge water needed. So I'm setting aside three gallons or about 11 liters of my tap water. The mash water needed for this one is 10.8 gallons or about 41 liters. But to keep this one simple, I didn't add any salts to the water to adjust the mineral levels of my tap water. So I'm just going with my base tap water levels. So I usually will try to boost the calcium level up a bit, say it above 50, but I figure my tap water profile is a decent fit for a light style beer. So I just go with that. So I have this new unopened bag of Murphy and Rude Pale Malt. Murphy and Rude is a maltster here in Virginia. One time before I split a bag with a friend, I used my 12.5 pounds. I used most of that in one beer. I think it may be an IPA or pale ale. And I've been very happy with the various Murphy and Rood base malts and their specialty malts that I've used. So I figured a single malt beer would provide a simple base for the yeast, but also give me a better feel for the Murphy and Rood pale malt. The grain bill then was 100% of that Murphy and Rood two row pale 
about 17.3 pounds or 7.8 kilograms. I've noticed I tend to get more dough balls with a Murphy and Rude malt. I often notice the same thing when I'm using, say, the Chris Maris Otter. I'm not sure what it is about those grains. So the target mash is 60 minutes at 152 degrees Fahrenheit or 66.7 degrees Celsius. So that's a fairly generic mash schedule. Boil is going to be for 30 minutes. So at 30 minutes into the mash, I did take my pH reading. I measured 5.45, which is pretty good range for this one. After 60 minutes, it's time to pull out the grain bag, dip the grain in my three gallons of sparge water. Then after a good stir, I give it a 10 minute rest, then another stir and squeeze. Sparge mound is added into the main wart, which looks like it's just about up to boiling temperatures at this point. Just before the start of the 30 minute boil, I added my hop addition, 1.4 ounces or 40 grams of Centennial to give me almost 16 IBUs. So I recently picked up some anti-foaming agent that I could use in the future, uh, but today I keep an eye out for a hot break and watch for a boil over. With 10 minutes left in the boil, I add my one tablet of Warflock and then eight grams of yeast nutrient. I've generally heard that yeast nutrient is really important for kvike yeast, so I double the amount that I normally would use. And I think that's especially true for lower gravity beers like this one. So at flame out, I add in then two ounces of Centennial. That's 3.5 IBUs. Just note on the hop amount, since this is basically a double batch, that would be about 1.7 ounces per 5.5 gallons, or about 50 grams total in a 21 liter batch. So that's 19 IBUs. So it's not a really gonna be a hoppy or a bitter beer. So I don't really expect the Centennial to stand out in this one. So I really want the yeast to showcase and also be able to showcase a little bit of that grain character. So now it's time to chill down the wart. Even with my jaded hydro chiller, which is a pretty nice unit, I struggle to lower the temperature much below around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. My tap water is just pretty warm in the middle of summer. But that's one of those benefits of using kvike yeast. Since 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a fine pitching temperature. So Buddy gave me this drill powered stirring wand. I gave it a try to see if I can get a whirlpool going. I don't know, it seemed to work okay. We'll see if I use it again in the future. So I have a few new toys I'm gonna to put to use in this batch. So Northern Brewer was closing out these stainless steel fermenters for only $75 each. Uh, I figured I could use a larger fermenter. And since I'd be doing split batches, I got a pair. Hard to beat at that price. They seem like a nice fermenter. The spigots, uh, they kind of seem a little overkill for a fermenter. So I divided up the wort between the two fermenters. Here's what's left in the kettle. There's a little bit of a cone of hops in the center. So I think the Whirlpool did an okay job. So speaking of new toys, this is the second time using my tilt hydrometers. So my general hope with these tilts is they'll help me gather more concrete data for the split yeast batch that I like doing. So there'd be more information that I can provide in the videos. So now it's time to add the yeast. So I direct pitch each five gram pack. First, the stalled in, then the e-train. So the instructions say that the five grams of yeast is enough for about 20 to 30 liters or five to eight gallons of warp. And that amount of yeast seems to work out fine in these batches. So looking at the fermentation data that I gathered from the tilt hydrometers, I saw similar results with both yeasts. So I pitched the yeast at around 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius. So in about four hours, I was starting to see fermentation activity. So I got near final gravity and really quick, about 36 hours. And I could see it would held at about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, about 30 degrees Celsius during that act of fermentation. And then the temperature settled down to my kind of warm room temperature. It was about 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius. And then it was after about 10 days that I kegged. I'm sure I could have kegged these earlier, but I was not really in a big rush. Give them a little time to clear. So looking at the stats for this batch. So efficiency, I mentioned, came a little bit below my planned 80%. So just over 75%. My original gravity around 1045. So looking at the E-Train batch. So final gravity of 1012, which gave me just over 72% attenuation and an ABV of 4.3%. The stalled in then, Attenuation was just about the same. I got 1013, which is just over 70% attenuation, an ABV of 4.2%. So these should be a nice light drinking beer. Great for a camp out. So I did dry some of the yeast in a pan in my oven, just with the light turned on. Have you ever dried kvike yeast before? How did it work out? Well, if this works out for me, I could put out a video with more TTL. Let me know if that's something you're interested in. And as I mentioned, I took the beers along to the Mid-Atlantic State's homebrew camp out in Cumberland, Maryland. So Mash Out, it's a great event with a bunch of great people, lots of homebrewed beer, but I don't have time to get into that now. It's time to taste some beers. So there we are with the beers. So the one on the right, that's the one with the Stalgian one. 
and the one on the left, that's the E-Train one. So if you're looking at the beers, the Stalzen one is a little more clear. They both have quite a bit of haze, but the, the E-Train one definitely has a more of a haze, more of a, these have been in the keg for, you know, two months now, I think almost, month and a half at least. So they haven't dropped clear. I'm a little curious because I didn't boost up the calcium. Calcium is supposed to help a little bit with the flocculation of yeast. I wonder if that would have made a difference. Either case, they're nice looking beers, especially these days. You know, hazy beers are kind of sexy looking, right? So if we start with the styles, and remember looking at the description, they kind of said notes of apple, ripe fruit, hint of cloves and anise. So this was the one that kind of said could potentially be a lager at low temperatures, but also fermented kind of those lager temperatures. So what is my uh, take on that? Yeah, I definitely can see where they're, they're talking about that. When you say clove, though, I, wanna, I don't want to say I can get kind of a, a clovey kind of character, but it's not like uh, the clove phenolics that you would get in a, you know, a spicy beer, like a Saison or something like that. Just a little bit of a hint of kind of a sweetness that kind of reminds you a little bit of, of cloves. The aroma is definitely some kind of some fruit. I could definitely see that description of you know, maybe a little bit of like an apple kind of pear kind of aroma. You know, I don't think I get much of the Centennial. There might be a little bit of a floral note from the Centennial. The taste on it, it's just very uh, nice, light, light body, easy drinking beer. So this is the one, I'm, I hear a dog in the background there. So this beer, I definitely get that kind of a lingering, nice kind of grainy note from the uh, Murphy and Rood Pale Malt. So I think this one kind of showcases the malt character a little better than the other batch when we get into that. But overall, you know, I, I think it's a really nice, enjoyable beer. It's definitely not lager-like. There's definitely a, quite a bit of uh, characteristic from the yeast. But I could see, I, I was serving it to a friend, and he said, like, why do you call this one an ale and not a lager? Because I think most people are just kind of light, easy-drinking beers. They associate that as lager. So, again, I'm not going to say that this is lager-like. There's definitely a lot of yeast character, a lot of fruitiness to it. But it's definitely an easy-drinking kind of, you know, this one probably fits the blonde ale character. So one of the things I think about, like, you know, what would I use this yeast for? What styles? Uh, I think this is one is our, this is a pretty good beer. You know, I think you could stick with the Centennial or you could swap it out uh, maybe for a more earthy, a sort of noble German hop, something like that. Make a really nice kind of easy drinking blonde ale that kind of leans into that. I think your friends that like uh, lagers may enjoy it just with a little bit more flavor to it. Uh, the other thing I was a little curious about, they say this can ferment pretty cool. So at cool temperatures, would it be a little more clean, a little more lager? Could be like, say, like a farmhouse lager, farmhouse coals. That might be interesting to try. So whether I get around to that or not, well, we'll see. I'm kind of interested in trying it out. But, you know, I've got a lot of other things I want to brew too. So we get into E-Tram one. Like you say, it definitely has a lot more of a haziness to it. It looks a lot like, say, a hazy IPA. It doesn't, definitely doesn't taste like a hazy IPA. So when I look at the description on that one, they mentioned ripe pear, plum, prune, and honey. So I definitely can get kind of a honey kind of character, a little bit of a sweetness, definitely a little bit of fruity. I could see a plum. The aroma on this one, you know, the, the, there's a lot of similarities between these beers. They're not, they're not drastically different. They're definitely different. This one I get a lot more some kind of lemony kind of character, maybe like a lemongrass kind of, kind of character. And I think, uh, you know, I was serving with some friends. I think some of them really like this one better. So in the taste, I still get, you know, that kind of lingering grain, which I think is that Murphy and Rude Pale Malt, which has just enough flavor. But I'd say this beer has a little bit more of a sweetness to it that maybe covers up a little bit of that maltiness character. So again, it's just, it's a really a nice, enjoyable beer, especially, you know, those low 4%, nice sessional beer. I don't mind uh, that I've got, you know, two pints here that I'm going to finish. So this strain, what would this work? I think this of the two, this is the one if I was going to make a hoppy beer with it, I think it would fit well. The one thing that came to mind would be maybe like in a wheat beer. I mean, it looks like a wheat beer, right? But I think that kind of lemon, that little bit of spiciness to it, I think would work really well, um, whether it's, it's not going to be a traditional like German Hefeweizen, but I think it'd be a more flavorful than just, you know, in a typical American wheat beer, which are, you know, kind of plain. You'd get a lot of, you know, character, you'd get the fruitiness, you'd get that lemon. So that's definitely on that list. Again, I have a long list of stuff that I really want to brew and stuff I want to play with. But I think taking this yeast, the uh, E-Tram, putting into, you know, say 20, 30, 40, 50% wheat beer, uh, say with more of a traditional uh, German hop, or maybe even something with more lemon, like the lemon drop, or, you know, a, a noble American type hop. I think that might make a really nice beer. 
So what about you? Have you used either of these yeasts before? What about some other dried kvike yeasts other than just say Lutra and Voss, the ones that are commonly available? What have you tried? What about drying yeast of your own and using that? Well, I'm curious. And if you're curious about those kind of things and other kind of experimental brewing, make sure you hit that subscribe and stick around for more future content. Thanks a lot and cheers.